All right, let's turn to Luke 15, if you would. Luke 15. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, and verse 11, Luke 15, 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, <coughs> excuse me, and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to, his house, to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in, therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make, make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word one here this afternoon. We pray that you'll bless the preaching of the Word of God. I realize, Lord, that I'm absolutely a zero, nothing without you, Lord. I pray that you'd fill me with your Spirit. Help me to say exactly what you would have me to say here today. I pray in Jesus' name. And amen. This is a familiar uh, portion of Scripture, and uh, here in Luke 15, it's been preached many different ways, many different outlines. Uh, through the centuries. And uh, I want to bring a message here uh, about some missing things in the story of the prodigal son. Some missing things in the story of the prodigal son. I'll give you six things here and we'll go eat. Amen? Amen. 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 What time are we supposed to eat, preacher? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That's a dangerous thing to say, amen. <laughs> this, this story here uh, can be preached. I've preached it, you know, backslidden Christian coming back to the Father. Uh, you can also preach it in the lost sinner, you know, coming to the Lord. It, make, it makes beautiful spiritual application. Doctrinally, it's, it's another thing, but uh, it makes beautiful spiritual application. I want to... Uh, give you some things that are missing here in the story of the prodigal son. First of all, I want to say that first thing that's missing is a person. A person. 
You say, what person is missing? You can read Luke 15 till you're blue in the face. And you find here in the story that the father is mentioned, the younger son's mentioned, the elder son is mentioned, the hired servants are mentioned, a citizen of the far country is mentioned, harlots are mentioned, but the mother is not mentioned. There's a missing person uh, in this story of the prodigal son, and that's the mother. In Psalms 27.10, the Bible says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. There's a Chinese proverb that says, When a child goes away from home, he carries his mother's hand with him. Just about everybody's mentioned except the mother. Now, right away, some people are thinking, well, Brother Kogel's going to preach on a woman working outside of the house. <laughs> no, I'm not preaching on that. I, I realize there's times, especially in the day and time we live in, the last 40 or 50 years, that a mother has to work outside the home sometimes. Maybe her husband has left her. She has to get a job. I don't know what's... The, people are going through all kinds of things today. And uh, I, I would just say this, that you want to make sure if you have children at home, uh, you want to try to do everything you can to be at home with those children if you're a mother. And the, hopefully the husband makes enough money uh, to, you know, to bring money in to pay the bills that the wife doesn't have to get a job outside the home. Maybe she can work on the computer or do something inside the home or something, make a few bucks or something. But you've got to work that out with the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. I, do, I have found this out in the last umpteen years preaching the Word of God is that I find that a lot of times mama's working because they want an extra Mercedes Benz in the driveway. Now somebody ought to shout and run the aisles on that one. <laughs> or they want to take a couple extra vacations a year. You say, what's wrong with that? I don't know. One's probably enough, isn't it? Uh, one or two little things, two little small vacations. Uh, Mom is working because, you know, just sometimes I've seen where mom, mama has to work. I've seen some incidents where mama really don't need to work, but mama or daddy or somebody just likes to spend money. It comes down to priorities in that home. You say, well, I work a job and I just take my kids to the daycare at 6, 7 in the morning. I pick them up at 6 at night. Do whatever you want to do. Do whatever you got to do. Uh, my wife, uh, we've got, had five children there and they're, of course, all raised and everything and and, uh, but she got a job at the library when our oldest started school, or our youngest started school. And, uh, and uh, of course, being in the ministry and stuff, I was able to take, <coughs> take them to school a lot of times if I wasn't out preaching somewhere or something. And, uh, but you, each family's got to do what they got to do. You, gotta, you have to work those things out with the Lord. But I found some mothers who don't work a job outside the home and they're not home enough to take care of their kids. They're out running all over kingdom come. And, and then the, and the mothers that do have to work a job, get outside the home and work in a job, then they take better care and take care of the things in the home better than the mother that's not working a job. You just have to work. You've got to get alone with God and say, God, uh, we, we want you to work this thing out for us. What do you want us to do? We want, to, we want these kids to be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we want mommy to be here. And uh, we don't want somebody for 12 hours a day, five days a week, raising our children. And so, God, can you work it out financially or whatever? You've got to work this thing out with the Lord. Amen? Amen. I remember when I worked a job there at, uh, I worked at uh, the uh, Kroger Bakery in 1980. And uh, make a long story short, uh, I, I found this out, that if you really seek God and really want God's will, God will work things out for you. 1980, I worked at Kroger Bakery. They have Kroger's around here, out here on the West Coast, Kroger's. Uh, it's uh, grocery stores. <coughs> Anyways, uh, based out of Cincinnati, Ohio there, and they're all over the place. But uh, I, was, I worked in the bakery there, and that's where I crushed my left hand in 1980. And... Uh, they thought they were going to, have to amputate my hand and everything. And, and uh, this doctor from India, reconstruction surgeon, said, I, I do the very best I can. I, I think I might have to take your hand. 
And, uh, you know, I was 23 years old. I didn't want to stub there the rest of my life. And, uh, and so uh, he left. And I was crying my eyeballs out there at the bedside at the hospital room there in 1980. And uh, I said, Lord, I don't want to lose my hand. Thank God I didn't have to lose it. But he told me, he said, you'll get arthritis at an early age. I start getting in my 40s. And I'm telling you what, in the cold, that thing turns purple. Amen. And uh, the, the uh, circulation and so forth. But uh, the Kroger Bakery there, to make a long story short, the, uh, uh, I've only been saved three years. In 77, I got saved. In 78, started preaching. 1980, I crushed my hand. And uh, 10 million other things. But anyways, uh, so uh, I, I looked at the schedule one day, and, and uh, I seen that they had me working on Sunday. And uh, I went to the supervisor, and I said, uh, hey, of course, I was young, you know, and and uh, I said, hey, I said, I can't work on Sundays. He said, what? And I said, I can't work on Sundays. He said, you, only been, you haven't been here that long at all. I said, I know I haven't. I said, I'm not trying to be a smart looking out. I said, but I said, I'll work as many hours you want me to through the week or whatever. I said, but I'm not working. I can't work on Sundays. And uh, I'm going to church on Sundays. And uh, Sunday morning, Sunday school, church, and Sunday night service. And uh, I'm not a Catholic Baptist. I don't go to just Sunday morning mass at 11 a.m., amen? But anyways, so uh, I, uh, I, and he said, well, he said, I don't know about that. He said, you know, I can try to work, I can try to talk to some, a couple other supervisors. He said, but you might have to work and this and that. I said, well, and I, I noticed that it was on like a Wednesday or Thursday or something, and, uh, and they had me working that, that Sunday three or four days. And so uh, I went ahead, I think I went ahead and worked one Sunday there, but I told him, I said, I'll go ahead and work this Sunday. I said, I'm not going to work any more Sundays. I can't work. And at that time, I made pretty good money in 1980 at the Kroger Bakery. But I told him, I said, if you're going to make me work Sundays, I said, I, I can't, I'll have to leave. I can't work. You say, well, I wouldn't have done something like that. I understand you've got to pay your bills. I understand that. We've got responsibilities. But I, maybe I was dumb. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. or maybe, And I would have walked out in two seconds flat if they were going to make me work every Sunday. There's no way I'd have stayed there. Good benefits, good money, and everything. But I wasn't going to do it. And uh, I wasn't married or nothing. And uh, you know, I was making good money. And I, I said, I can't work it. You, you got it. This thing about working and missing church and missing being not being where God wants you to be and all that, you got to get along with God and say, God, I want to serve you. And I believe God will work things out for you. You might not do it in 20 minutes, but I'll tell you what, God will work things out for you. If you want to do right, if you want to do right. You know what's one of the things missing here? You can read the story of the prodigal son till you're blue in the face. You'll find out that a person is missing the mother. Now, we find out that <clears throat> Timothy turned out to be a fine young man. A fine young man. And we find out that really his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, according to 2 Timothy 1.5, basically raised him. His father is uh, not mentioned. Nothing is mentioned about Timothy's father except in Acts 16.1. It says that his, he was a Greek. So there was a, uh, there was a interracial marriage there. Uh, he, was, he was a Greek and she... Uh, was a Jewess. And, uh, and so Timothy was not circumcised. And you'll read in Acts 16, 1 to 3, that Paul knew this, that Timothy wasn't circumcised because his dad was a Gentile and his mother was a Jewess. And you'll find out for the sake of testimony, Paul circumcises Timothy. Because the people in those quarters knew that his father was a Gentile and his mother was a Jewess. And they knew, and circumcision was a big thing to Jews. There's some things God wants you to do and not do for the sake of testimony. Because you can preach and witness till you're blue in the face to some people, but if they, there's something about you or whatever that offends them, uh, they're not going to listen to you. I don't care if you're the greatest preacher or Christian witness in the world. Paul knew that. And Paul says, I'm taking you, Timothy, to all these regions around here and preaching the word of God. And I'm going to, uh, you're going to preach the word of God with me. You're my son in the faith. But the Jews know your dad's a Gentile and your mother's a Jewess. And so you haven't been circumcised. And that's a stumbling block to those Jews. 
Some things you have to do just for the sake of testimony. But mother's missing. And you know what? Grandma, uh, Grandma Lois and Mother Eunice raised Timothy. And it's implied that they had a very good uh, impression upon his life. And Timothy turns out to be one of the greatest men in the Bible. A young man for God that loved God. He got two books named after him. First and second Timothy. Grandma and mother. Eunice and Lois. A person is missing. You ought to thank God if you got a good mom, mother. You ought to thank God for a mother for that's saved and loves God and wants to, is serving God and has served God, has a good testimony. Thank God for you mothers. Amen. You wouldn't believe the number of uh, years. Uh, down through the years, it's always been, you know, men will be drunks or drug addicts. And they'll leave their families and stuff like that. Men, men will do that right and left. But I'm going to tell you something. In the last 20 or 30 years, you wouldn't believe the number of uh, reports and the number of stories that I've heard down through the years where a woman will leave her husband, meet somebody on the internet, and leave a husband and maybe one or two or three children. That's become a big thing just in the last 20 years, 25 years. You hear about it all the time. Thank God for mothers. But this story here, the mother's not mentioned. I don't know why. I don't know why the mother's not mentioned. A person is missing, and that's the mother. Thank God for you moms that are saved and love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you something else. Let me just say this quickly. Not only is a person missing, but a prayer is missing. A prayer. Uh, nobody is praying for this prodigal son. You don't find in this entire chapter or any other part of the Bible that refers to this chapter where anybody is praying for the prodigal son. Now, let me ask, I'm not trying to be mean, but I want to ask you something here. When was the last time you prayed for a prodigal? I'm not talking about, oh, Lord, we pray you'll deal with their heart and bring them back home, or we pray they'll start serving you again like they used to. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm talking about really getting under the burden. Let's do that in 2020. I mean, with, I mean, with sincerity and seriousness, a prayer. Nobody's praying for this prodigal here. Prayer is to the soul what breathing is to the body. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Psalms 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. God wants... God wants you to pray to him and he wants to answer your prayer more than you want to see your prayer answered. You say, what? Yes. He wants you to pray. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence, confidence that we have in him. And if, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. God wants to answer your prayers. The devil will work on your brain and tell you there is no need to pray. God's not going to answer your prayer. It's not God's will to do what you're praying about. If God's going to do it, he's going to do it anyways. Why are you praying? The devil does everything he can to discourage you from praying. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man <coughs> availeth much. James 5.16. If you're saved, you're righteous. You have the righteousness of God if you're born again. And God wants you to pray the effectual fervent prayer. Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the devil knows that and he'll do everything he can to stop you from praying. The Bible says in James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. You ask, uh, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. James 4, verse 2 and 3. Folks, this year, we're only four days into the year. Let's This year, 2020, as I mentioned last night, let's have a 2020 vision. 
house to house. Acts 20, verse 20. Let's saturate our neighborhoods, our areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I'm not trying to be mean, but I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I, I know some preachers and Christian people. I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about politics. I am. I preach on it a lot. I say some things. We're on nine radio stations. I say some things. I'm saying what people hate my guts. I know you can't imagine that, but I'm just saying. And, uh, but I know some Christian people and pre preachers that are more involved and get more stirred up about politics than they do the Bible. Than they do the things of God. Now, that's the truth. They are more engulfed. You say, well, preacher, well, we should be concerned about it. I, we are, I am. But God ought to be first. The Bible ought to be first. Thank God President Trump got elected. I hope he gets reelected in November of this year. Praise God for all that. But I want to tell you what. Spend some time talking about God too. Amen. And the Bible. Amen. I know some Christians and I, I like, I, whenever I'm, I can hear him, I listen to Rush Limbaugh. But I know some people that are so caught up with Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and Laura Ingram and Fox News and everything else. And I, that's the only news I watch. But I want to tell you something. That, does not, that is not my number one God in my life. Amen. Amen. I tell you, the devil will, will distract you from the main things in life. There's some missing things in the story of the prodigal son. A prayer is missing. And then thirdly, I want to say this. I haven't made you mad yet. This will probably make some of you mad. Amen. Amen. That isn't my desire to do. There's a person missing, a prayer is missing. Thirdly, a protest is missing. You say, what do you mean a protest? Well, in Luke 15, verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. Why doesn't the father protest? You read these verses, not one thing does the father Protest about it. He said, what do you mean? Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. I'm getting out of here. I'm, you know, basically, I'm not trying to read into the Bible. But basically, I mean, he's probably tired of the rules and regulations. He's a prodigal. He's leaving the house. He doesn't like what's going on. He's going to get out on his own because he thinks he can do things better. Wrong. Now. We commend the father for saying, when, he, when the son came back, we commend the father, and I've done it many times preaching and so forth, and preachers do this, is that we, the, pre, the father didn't sit the son down and say, tell me all the wicked sins you've been involved in. Tell me everything you did when you were out there in that far country. And we commend the father here in the story for that. And that's great and that's wonderful. But also, on the other hand, the father didn't protest. Now, I'm going to say something to moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. As I mentioned last night, we went from four grandchildren to eight grandchildren this year. My daughter-in-law that had identical twin boys and my daughter had twins, a boy and a girl. And we already had four. So from March to October, we went in 2019, we went from four to eight grandchildren. I love them. I'm telling you what, that little Mackenzie, that little... She got me wrapped around her finger, man. I'm telling you what, uh, and everything. But I'm going to tell you what, believe it or not, there are times when I say, no, let's practice it together, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. No. The father come to him and said, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he could have said, no, over my dead body. Now, in this politically correct, left-wing, liberal, God-hating, reprobate society that we live in today, that's a no-no. Because in the average home in America today, you know who runs the home? The wife and or the kids. That never took place in my home. I love my wife. I love my kids. There's not room for two Indian chiefs under one roof. 
You got, when you have two heads in a church, two heads in a school, you know there's not two presidents in the United States? I know some of these Democrats think they are, but anyways, or they want to be. There's only one president. There's only one principal. There's only one pastor in a church. When you have two heads, you have a freak. And I'm going to tell you something. This father didn't protest. The, the prodigal left. And I've talked with parents. And if you've done this, sorry, you're not right with God about this thing. I've talked with parents saved and lost. Brother Kogel, we let our kids drink alcohol in our house because they're going to drink anyways. So we let them drink. And Brother Kogel, we let them smoke some little doobies, some pot. Also, because they're going to do it anyways. <laughs> you make it as hard on them as you can to sin against God. You don't let the excuse, the old time uh, people, the old time uh, people in America, even unsaved people. You know, 60, 70 years ago, the average unsaved man feared God more than a lot of Christians do today. Back in the old days, you say no, and you make it as hard on them as you can to sin. Today, it's like, well, I just didn't want to argue with them. I just didn't want to fuss with them. We let our son and his girlfriend, Brother Kogel, or our daughter and her boyfriend, they're not married, but we let them, we got a little room for them down there in the basement, and they fornicate, and you know, they're like, they're married, they're like, Baloney, amen. Where's a protest? The father divides unto him his living. He'll say a word. Oh, you want your inheritance? He could have said, you're not getting your inheritance now. Because you're going to go out and waste it. you got to be careful about giving kids a bunch of money. If they're not mature enough right now to handle it, you're, not, you're going to enable them. You're going to enable them to destroy themselves because they're not mature enough to handle it. There's a lot of older people that aren't, aren't mature enough to handle money. Let alone an 18, 20, 25 year old. Or 16 year old. Protest. They're going to do it anyways. We let them smoke pot. They say it. Some of them say it like they're proud of it. You like to smack them right in the face. But you can't. Because God won't let you. We let them fornicate. And we let them smoke reefer. And do drugs. And drink booze. Because, And they say it like they're really... They've really found something out really, that's really a spectacular thing that they have come across. And I, 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 I go, oh, yeah. You <laughs> say, I don't agree with you. Well, I want you to look at what God said about a man in the Bible about Eli. I want you to turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'll show you this and I'll go to my fourth point. I'm not going to preach as long as I did last night. Amen. <laughs> look here. Look here. I want to show you this. Uh, you got to see it. I'm not trying to be a smart like I want to show you what God says here. This isn't my opinion. This isn't something Steve Kogel just thought up. Look here at 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I'll tell you something. I'll be honest. I've read these verses for years. And I'll be honest with you. From a human standpoint, it looks like God's kind of hard on Eli. You say, what? Yeah, it kind of looks like God's a little bit hard on Eli. Look, you say, what do you mean? Look at 1 Samuel 2.12. Now, Eli's sons, they're priests. And look here at the apostasy and their judgment. 1 Samuel 2.12. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was... That when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came 
while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest, all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Verse 15. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. These are these boys. They say, give it to me now. You know what's one of the characteristics of a spoiled brat or a spoiled adult? Is when they say, I want it now. Give it to me and give it to me now. They're 25 years old. Look here. And if not, I'll take it by force. 17. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. And how they lay with the women. Look at this. Lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It'd be like Eli's sons laying out there in front of those front doors of this sanctuary. Committing fornication with women right out in front of the church house. How would you like to have kids like that? Verse 23, and he said unto them, Eli says to his boys, why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. In other words, it got back to, to him through all the people. You know what your boys are doing in front of the church? The temple, 24. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, watch this. They hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would slay them. Now, it looks like Eli did attempt to try to stop his boys from doing these evil, wicked things, does it not? Well, look what God says in the next chapter. Chapter 3, verse 11. 1 Samuel 3, 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I'll perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. Whew, man. 13, watch this. God says, For I have told him, told Eli, that I will judge his house forever. For the iniquity which he knoweth, God says, Eli knows, because he tells you what it is. His sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Now, let me ask you a question. Maybe I'm missing something here. If I am, please tell me after the service. And I mean it. I mean it. I'm not trying to be a smart guy. I mean it. Did he try to restrain his sons? He told them not to do such evil things, but they wouldn't hearken to him. God says, I'm going to judge your house. Because you didn't restrain your sons. So I guess God literally, and I'm not trying to exaggerate this story, but I guess God literally wanted, the, wanted Eli to go out in front of the church house when the, these men who were naked, co committing fornication with naked a woman, and grab a hold of them while they're fornicating and grab them, I guess, his son by the head of the head and drag them clear out and say, stop it! <laughs> what else did he mean? I mean, he said, don't do this, boys. I've heard from the people in the community what you're doing. Stop it. They went ahead and did it anyways. And then God says, I'm going to judge you because you didn't restrain your boys. What does God expect of him? I said, I, I don't know how else to get out of this. Someone, someone explain it to me after the service. 
I guess God wanted him to grab the woman by the hair of the head and his son by the hair of the head and drag him. You say, you're a rabid fanatic. No, God might be. What does he mean? God says, Eli, I'm going to judge your house forever. Because you didn't restrain your sons. I know men, their boys, there's something about that age, about boys and girls. There's something about that age, about 13 to 20. They know everything. And the hormones start working. And uh, the smart aleck responses and attitudes and remarks start and everything. And uh, I don't know. The poor old Eli, he got the judgment of God on him. Because he didn't restrain his sons, it says. Oh, I say, Lord, what you want him to do? Get a bulldozer? And bulldoze them at the front of the church while they're fornicating like this. And scoop them all up. Yes, boys. How many? What do you have? Two or three boys? I mean, were they all out there at the same time? I, mean, I don't know. Well, the Bible's pretty plain, isn't it? You know what Hollywood does? And New York City and Paris and France, London and all these cities. They glamorize sin. They giggle about it. <laughs> they fornicate it. <laughs> they laugh about sin. God don't laugh about sin. Fools make a mock at sin. Proverbs 14, 9. Because people don't understand the consequences of it with God. You see the consequences with God? God doesn't sit there and say, Well, yeah, they are fornicating, aren't they, out there in front of the church? Yeah, they sure are. Well... Well, it's all right. It's no big deal. That's the way the average Christian think, looks at it. It ain't no big deal. Don't get rabid and fanatical about it. I mean, we don't believe, we don't believe in child abuse. Come on. I don't either. I've talked to men who have gotten in fist fights with their teenage sons. Christian men. Good Christian men. Preachers. Fist fights. You say, what in the world? Yeah, it's a real world out there, isn't it? I don't know what God expected of Eli. Like I said, I don't know. But there's a protest. He should have said, no! I'm not giving you your inheritance because you're not mature enough to handle it. You're going to go out and waste it, which he did. You gotta kind of, you gotta pray about things. You gotta kind of go by your gut feeling too. You gotta kind of, you gotta, you gotta walk with God. You gotta kind of, you kind of sense things. You gotta have discernment. You gotta kind of walk with God and read the Bible and know God and know the Word of God and know what's going on. Protest number four, quickly. You know something else that's missing the story of the prodigal son? A preacher. No preacher, priest. Prophet, nothing's mentioned. What happened to, let's go talk to the pastor about this. How's come the pastor? I'm not saying, I know God's first and God's the one we ought to go to and the word of God. I know, let's, let's all be real spiritual for a second. We, know, we go to God and we go to Jesus and, and I know all that. But what's wrong with maybe the pastor, and say, preacher, I just want to ask him, what do you think about this decision? Me and my wife, me and my husband, we're going to make, we don't know for sure what will be the, you know what you want to do? You know what a good president does? You know what a good leader does? You know what a good pastor does? He gets a few people that he trusts that got a, you know, half a brain in their head, and he gets some of their wisdom and gets some of their input in a decision they're going to make. Whether it's a country, a president, a church, a pastor, uh, you know, a corporation or whatever. And then 
he makes the final decision. But you get input from a few different people that you trust in that's got a brain in their head and got a little bit of wisdom about them. And, you, and Proverbs talks about that. I forget the, where the verse is at in there, but, but you've you, you got you, you to gotta have count, make counsel, get counsel from some different people that you trust in, and you might make some pretty good decisions in your life. What's wrong? Not that he's God. I'm a shoe coming. <laughs> I'd already bend over and tie my shoe, but what's wrong with coming to saying, preacher, uh, we were going to do this. I didn't know what you might think about it, but we want to make this decision. I was wondering what, what you might think about it. We wanted to come by and just see what you thought. Now, don't go to the pastor about every little thing in your life. <laughs> Because then you'll end up in the psycho ward. <laughs> you'll have to go visit him in the psycho ward. <laughs> but I'm talking about some decision. I mean, the, the, past, the preacher's missing. There's no preacher missing, missing here. If there's a prodigal son, there's a father that gives the, this prodigal son his living there. And you got a Pharisee for an elder son. you got uh, different servants and different people that are mentioned all through this chapter, this story here. No preachers mentioned, no pastor, no priest, nothing. What happened to the pastor in our lives? Well, we don't agree with him on some things. Oh, <laughs> grow up. Grow up, man. You agree with your husband and wife on everything? Some of you men are scared to death to say no, amen. Yeah, I know how that works. <laughs> Jeremiah 3.15, And I'll give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Amen. Ephesians 4.11 and 12, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen. Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. How about it? No pastor. You know a lot of Christians, the pastor's missing out of their lives? You'd be surprised the number of Christians in America, they don't even have a home church. They go over here, and they go to church over there, and they go to church over here, and they go to church over there, and they go... They don't want to settle down nowhere, first of all, so they won't have to give no tithe. Woo! Do your head like that real good. And they don't want to settle down nowhere because somebody might require something of them. And they don't want to settle down nowhere because they won't be in that church six months. And you know what they'll start noticing? That everybody is a sinner. That's got defects. That's what happens to a lot of people. They get, you know, they get saved. You know, they're a young Christian. You know, they're all excited about God. Six months or a year, two years down the road in the church, they start realizing, oh, brother so-and-so, oh, he's kind of, sister so-and-so, she's kind of weird. <laughs> Brother so-and-so, he's, oh, he's whacked out a little bit. And the, the preacher is definitely a little wacky and everything. Let me tell you something. Any church you go to, there's going to be some wacky people. So quit making stinking excuses. Get in there. And you got you, to be godly. You know what God does with me? You think I'm not a mess? You know I'm a mess. I mean, you know what God does? Despite my messes, he still blesses me. And uses me. What you've got to be able to do if you're going to be a spiritual mature Christian is when you get into a local church, you're a family. And you know what? You know things about your family members that nobody else knows. And there's things about your family members that drive you crazy. <laughs> but you still love them. Because they're your family. You've got to rise above that. Yes, sir. You've got to get above that. You've got to be a big boy and a big girl. Spiritually. I'm not saying condone sin. I'm not saying look over wicked, filthy, perverted sins or anything like that. And even in that, you've got to have a little mercy. But I'm talking about even people's little things that just drive you a little bit quirky. They got little quirks about them. They got little, we're all got, we all got defects in us. We're all sinners saved by grace. It's going to be that way no matter what church you go to. Even Bible-believing, fundamental, independent, soul-winning, King James Street preaching church. You're going to find people that are kind of, maybe not, maybe not your cup of tea. 
Find somebody that is. You can't dwell on all that junk. You got to be able to rise above that stuff. That's human stuff. That's human stuff. You got to look above that to do something for God. This work is bigger than you and I. This work is bigger than you that are in this church, each other, and the church is represented. The church is bigger. They're trying to get the gospel. The pastor's already told about YouTube and all the people that they're affecting and all the, him and his, uh, 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 Jinha, and all the, uh, these thousands of people that are listening to him on the radio and uh, articles in the paper and all this. The gospel's going out. So we don't have time to sit around and say, did you see her? She never even said hi to me. I walked right by her. You, she could have reached out and kissed me. I was so close and she looked the other way. She might have had something on her mind. I've gone by people before and I've had 19,000 things on my mind. And I walk right by him, and then I start thinking about, I walk right by him. I never even looked at him or said hi to him or nothing. I thought, I said, hey, brother, I didn't mean to walk by. I said, this guy's all on my mind. I'm not trying to make excuses, but how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Somebody might have some problems. you got to kind of be a little bit, you got to be aware of these things. You can't, oh, did you hear him? I think he was talking about me. He hurt my feelings. I'm never going back there again. You'll never go to any church longer than six weeks. Because it's got a bunch of people that got defects. You know, a lot of these stores, they got merchandise that's reduced in price because it's got defects. You might go to a place, a washer and dryer has got a big scratch along the side of it. So instead of selling for $10 million, you know, it's $5 million. They've reduced the price of the merchandise because it's defect, defected material. We're all defects. I don't care if you've been saved 75 years. I don't care if you know the Bible inside and out. That's what we all are. And, and a local body and a church, you've got to learn to work together. You're a body of believers. You've got to realize this thing is bigger than me. This work is bigger than all of us. We were doing something for the glory of God. Quickly. Oh, it's time to eat. Uh, <laughs> number four, a preacher is uh, miss, And I could take you to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. To know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Know them. Try to be a blessing to your pastor. And let me say this. Pastor's wife. I heard a preacher preach a message down south. He said the most neglected person in the church is the pastor's wife. You said, I don't like that. You'll get over it. <laughs> you get your heart right, one or the other. Uh, and then Hebrews 13, verse 7, 17, and 24 says, Remember them that have the rule over you. Obey them that have the rule over you. All that. The, you know what? You know what? I'll just tell you this, and I'll go to my, I'll go to my next to last point. Uh, <clears throat> When we were down at Brother Homer Smith's church, my wife and I, we found out, it used to be a little blessing to the preacher. We found out when Brother Homer's birthday was and Miss Ellie's birthday was. They're both in heaven now. And in fact, we tried to find, we found out, we didn't try, we found out when their anniversary was. So we had them three dates. The eight years we were in that church, we had those three dates marked on our calendar. We didn't go out and buy them a million dollar gift, but we went out and bought them a little something. For his birthday, for her birthday, and for their anniversary. Because we wanted to honor them. We wanted to honor them that labor among you and are over you and the Lord. They watch for your soul. You wouldn't believe the number of pastors that are out of the ministry. Because either the pastor's health is failing... Brother, I just had Rick Prophet in, the pastor down in Glasgow, Kentucky. I had him in for a meeting. He got up and he said, he, he said, he said, you say, preacher, what would cause a Baptist preacher to cuss? He said, a Baptist church. <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't believe the number of pastors in the last 30 years that have gotten out because the wife was done. 
done. And if she ain't going to stay in there, he can't really. I'm telling you. I've heard it so many times around the country. And so I got, you know what you got? You got all these preachers now getting out of pastoring. Because it's driving them crazy. Or their wife crazy. And what's happening is, is that dealing with, dealing with people. Dealing with situations, circumstances, things like that. And, and, and what, you wouldn't believe the number of calls I get at the church that I pastor. Or we get letters. All these pastors are going into all these different kinds of ministries. We're going over to the mission field to uh, help build a playground. We're going over here to help them build a gymnasium, you know, or this and that. We need $5,000 a month, you know, support and this and that. They're getting out of the pastor. They're either going into evangelism or they're, get, they're concocting some kind of a ministry to get into so they won't totally get out of the ministry. But they're getting out of the pastorate. Amen. There's something else missing. A place is mentioned. The house of God's not mentioned. I'll just quickly say this. No church is mentioned. You know, church used to be the focal point, focal point of the family. Now it's aerobics, sports, gymnastics, ball field. The church used to be first in people's lives. Now it's last. If it's even on the list at all. Amen. God will do things for you in a church service that he will not do any other place. Yeah, amen. Some, you say, what do you mean? This is just a brick and mortar building. I know. But it's the place set aside. Amen. It's the place set aside to gather here whenever your services are. You know, and we won't turn to it the second time because I'm going to go to my last point. But in Deuteronomy 6... Several verses in that chapter, it says, The place which the Lord thy God shall choose. The place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Talking to Israel. The place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Three or four or five times in that chapter. This is the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen for those of you that this is your church. And God will do things for you in church services here that he won't do out in a fishing boat or out in a picnic or anything else. Or even anywhere. Place place. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5.25. Last of all, I want to say this. There's, there's something else missing. There's not only a person, the mother, a prayer, <clears throat> a protest, a preacher, a place, but number six, this kind of goes along with the protest, but there's a prophecy is missing. A prophecy is missing. You say, what do you mean a prophecy? The father not telling his son anywhere in the scriptures in Luke 15 that if you go to the far country, son, I'm going to tell you you're going to get out there in that old world out there and they're not going to want you after you don't have any more money. You say, you don't know. He might have. It doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures. A prophecy. Prophesy to him. Hey, Lot. Hey, Lot. Yes? Somebody would have knocked on Lot's tent door. Hey, Lot, let me tell you something, buddy. Don't pitch your tent. You pitched your tent towards Sodom in Genesis 13. And now in chapter 19, verse 1, you're right inside the gate. Some of you are pitching your tent towards Sodom and the decisions you make. You're not there yet. But you're on your way, baby. And the decisions that you make. Pitched his tent in Genesis 13. 19, 1, he's right there. Hey, Lot. Don't go to Sodom. Lot, I'm telling you something. There's a bunch of Sodomite perverts in that town. And I'm going to tell you what. You're going to vex your righteous soul from day to day with your unlawful deeds by what you see and what you hear. 2 Peter 2, verse 7 and 8. Don't go down there. Don't go down there, Lot. I'm telling you what's going to happen, Lot. You're going to offer your own daughter, daughters, to a bunch of Sodomites. Your wife's going to turn into a pillar of salt. Please don't go there, Lot. I'm prophesying to you, Lot. Don't go there. Don't make that decision. Hey, young man, don't marry that unsaved girl. 
Hey, young man, don't marry that unsaved girl. Hey, young lady, don't marry that unsaved boy. Well, he's so cute. <laughs> Honey, after you go through this great tribulation for a couple years of your marriage, that cuteness won't even mean a hill of beans to you. You better trust God. And you better wait on God. Wait on God. You say, I don't want to be an old maid. Sometimes it's best to be alone than it is to have the wrong one. Now, somebody ought to shout around the aisles on that one. It's best. Wait on God. God knows right where you're at. You think God's stupid? <laughs> God knows right where you're at. And He knows how to bring you and that girl or that boy together. And He knows when to do it. How to do it. I talked to a young man the other day. He said, I'm 26 years old. And I'm going to be... I'm gonna be I'm going to be an old man for as long. I said. He said, I I'm ready for a woman. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not, son. I've watched you. I've watched you for a few years. I you're not ready yet. Honestly, I love you, but you're not ready yet. Dr. Don Green, who, if he lives to be in June, he'll be, he's born in 28. So he'll be 90. Two in June. He's in a wheelchair. He pastored for, in Lansing, Michigan for, he preached for almost 70 years total. 60 years at one church. From 1955 to 2015, he pastored that church. I preached for him up there. He preaches against everything, but hard preaching. One time I, I had him in church. I was pastoring there back in the 80s. And uh, he looked over at me. I was 30 years old then. He looked over at me. He said, uh, Real, I mean, real casual, nonchalant, wasn't being mean or arrogant or nothing. He said, Brother Steve, how old are you? And I said, 30. Then it was in 87. I said, 30. And he said, he looked at his wife and he goes, well, he said, you're about at that age where you're about ready to put away your toys. He said, the average guy, he said this 32 years ago. The average guy said it's usually about 30, 32, where they're, they're ready to grow up a little bit and put away their toys. That's what he said. You say, I, that makes me mad. That offends me. Don't get mad at him. I don't get mad at him. You want to know why? Because he's right. Girls usually grow up a little sooner or quicker, usually most of them. Not all of them, but. <laughs> Despise not prophesying, 1 Thessalonians 5.20. Elimelech and Naomi, you don't want to leave Bethlehem, Judah, and go down to Moab. Please don't go down to Bethlehem, Judah. Don't leave Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread, and go down to Moab. We're just going to sojourn, Ruth chapter 1 says. Sojourn means we're not going to hang our hat anywhere for a long time. People got good intentions about these things. We're just going to stay a little while. But sin keeps you longer than you want to stay. It takes you further than you want to go. It costs you more than you want to pay. And they left. And guess what? Daddy, the father of Limelech, died. And the two boys died. And Mama comes back with two daughter-in-laws. And Orpah comes back, comes, there, comes back for a little while. And then she says, I'm out of here. I'll see you. I'm not really, I'm not really wanting to go to that God I'm really not interested in it. I'm going to go back to my gods. 
even though it's a bunch of junk back there where I was at, I'm not going to take the true and living God. But Ruth clave with her mother-in-law. You see that? Lost the dad and the two boys. Out of the will of God. You want to be in the will of God. Young people, I'm telling you what. You want to marry the right person. God has somebody for you. God has somebody for you. You just got to wait. I've seen so many young people. They just run, run ahead of God. They're going to do it themselves. Within five or ten years, usually there's one or two kids involved, three, maybe three kids. What a mess. I'm not saying this to hurt nobody. I'm saying this especially for the young people. Because I've seen the stinking, rotten, low-down, rotten devil destroy a lot of young people's lives. There's no prophecy. I'm about done. Listen to this. Young person, if you go to that church that has that contemporary rock music, it ain't going to be good for you. Prophecy. No prophecy. If you go to that church that doesn't believe the King James Bible is the word of God. If you court or date that girl or boy that is unsaved. If you marry that unsaved boy or girl. And let me tell you something. Hey, girls. Guys especially know how to turn on the spirituality. They'll act like an Apostle Paul around you. I mean, they'll get so spiritual. They'll act so holy. They'll see you coming and they'll open up their Bible. <laughs> Hi, honey. I'm just trying to memorize scripture. <laughs> I ain't never memorized a scripture in their life. They'll act so holy. And they'll look so sweet. And that girl, a lot of girls know how to do it too. They'll act like a sweet little Christian girl. They're, check, they're, they're, they're just wait a little bit. I'm not saying you got to wait 10 years to see if he or she is right, but you want to pray. You can't always go on the way things look. You've got to go on God's will. Because God knows things you don't know about that boy or that girl. And it might not be the right fit for you. It might not be meat. It might not be the right, the right one for you. And as the pastor already said, the most important decision in your life is getting saved, but the second is who you're going to marry. You don't want to miss God on that one. You say, what if I've missed God? I don't know. I don't know your situation. God can still use you, but there'll be some heartache in your life, especially if there's children involved. When there's a child born, one or two, three kids, whatever, there's children involved. I hate to tell you, but you're, that usually, that change you to that person, at least until the kids are 18, but maybe even for longer than that. That's a long time. And you want to go on with your life, and you've met somebody else, and this and that, and you've got this dragon a thing all the time. You got to deal with this ex. Just wait on God and do right. God's way is always the best. And then here I got one more here. Uh, don't go to that church where the pastor don't preach the Bible. Uh, don't hang around that certain boy or girl. You're going to get in trouble. And don't get alone with that boy or girl. Any place, in a car, in a house, anywhere alone, without a chaperone. I'm done.